being shared, you know. Hi, Chris. Hi, Pradeep, everyone, Peter. Hello. Hello. Hi, everybody. Hello. I'm not you, Mustafa. I already talked to you too, too much today. <laughs> <laughs> All right, maybe I think we should get going. Uh, so uh, just to uh, uh, mention uh, past quality conversations have gone long past one hour because there was a lot of enthusiasm, interest and uh, differing opinions and discussions and whatnot. So I try to just keep the conversation going, but I understand if you have to leave early within an hour, uh, we are recording the talk and we'll be sharing it as soon as uh, uh, possible. So I encourage you to stay. I think because of, I personally feel because it's such a niche, important topic that is not fully explored. There's a lot of questions from everybody coming from very different perspectives. So it takes a little while to warm up and to get into the weeds and interesting parts of the discussion. So if possible, try to stay, but I understand if you have to leave, just a little bit of warning. Yeah. Um, so without further ado, let me start introducing uh, Dr. Jean Chen, which who probably doesn't need an introduction to this audience, but for the sake of um, future viewers on YouTube and whatnot. Uh, so Dr. Jean Chen is an associate professor in uh, medical biophysics at the uh, University of Toronto. She's also the director of the Cranium Lab at Baycrest. I mean, kudos to the fantastic acronym. <laughs> and the Canada Research Chair in Neuroimaging of Aging. Uh, she received her MSc in Electrical Engineering from the University of Calgary, her PhD in Biomedical Engineering from uh, McGill University, and completed her postdoctoral training in multimodal MRI <clears throat> of brain imaging at the Martino Center from, for Biomedical Imaging. MGH in uh, Harvard Medical School. Her uh, current research themes include, her lab's current research themes include, one, investigating the physiological basis of resting state of MRI. Two, the development of new brain mapping techniques to map vascular and neuronal health. And three, multimodal integration of functional vascular and structural MRI techniques to study the mechanisms of brain aging and age-related neurodegenerative diseases. So I must also disclose, I was a postdoc at the uh, Baker Health Sciences under uh, great Stephen Strother. So I interacted with Jean uh, Drotman uh, for a little while. So I know that she's doing wonderful work and especially at Baycrest where brain aging is actually such an important focus of research. They work directly with patients trying to solve real world problems too. So without further ado, um, Jean, please take over. Yeah, thank you so much for that introduction. I missed uh, our interaction since you left Baycrest and had a faculty position. So um, definitely a gap that I have to fill. Um, but anyhow, uh, so I, I don't know if I know everybody or everybody knows me, but um, today's talk is sort of half based on my um, OHBM symposium from last year, but it, it was really short. I thought it, it deserved more time. And also we'll do a little bit of uh, intro on just resting state of my um, issues in regarding QC and noise. So it's, it's not, meant to be very formal, but at the same time, because we all have to finish um, on some sort of schedule. So I guess we can leave the questions till the end of the talk. Uh, hope that's okay with everybody. So I will share my screen so that you can see. Can everybody see? Yep. Okay. So I do have some internet. Um, issues here and there. So I'll just turn off my video so that the talk can be uninterrupted um, for now. Okay, so 
Um, today's talk is, I, as you can see, it's quite general. Um, this revisiting QC targets in resting state FMI um, is a very broad topic. I will just focus mostly on uh, things that lead up to physiological denoising and how we should regard it. So QC targets. Um, so some of the applications for having QC targets, so quality control QC, um, to me, they include things like evaluating an experimental paradigm, for example, um, is a particular task good enough to assess something or evaluating scanners or hardware like head coils and uh, looking at the stability um, and signal to noise, evaluating different populations to see um, how the, um, the, the pre-processing of my works for one population versus another perhaps. And finally, of course, down to pre-processing pipeline themselves, evaluating them uh, for different data sets and to see if, if they're doing the job we want them to do. So, um, so there are some QC targets. I, I came across this GitHub um, tool that uh, is called Pi fMRI. So basically the idea is to provide a very quick um, fMRI QC, a very quick assessment of some standard QC parameters, uh, things that include um, sort of drift and variability. So drift as defined in this, you know, 1999 paper is very, you always see this sort of very low frequency shift over time in an experiment, whereas the variance is of course the variance. And in task-based experiments, you can assume that you don't want any of this, this is not of interest. Right, but that is not the case for resting state. Um, there have been papers over the years. So this one I found, uh, Human Brain Mapping 2005 by Stoker and colleagues. Um, so basically listing at 1.5 Tesla some, some QCT parameters. So for this, we're using a phantom. So with a phantom, you don't expect there to be any resting state fluctuations. So uh, we want stability. So stability is minimization of variance and also minimiz minimization of drift. So we wanna be able to quantify those. So um, the next two studies I will also show are both based on phantoms as well. Um, they basically, you have this convenient assumption that signal variability is a bad thing. Um, so again, you see a certain deviation of the signal over time. This is based on what's now known as the F-burn phantom. Uh, percent drift and also temporal fluctuation. This one is a little bit different from the typical temporal fluctuation. As you can see, this is only the fluctuation after removing drift. So um, drift itself can introduce variability, but this is removed from this particular parameter. So this is from uh, Gary Glover's lab. And then so based on this residual fluctuation, they introduced the SFNR. Um, basically, it's like a temporal SNR, except the, the noise component is only, you know, medium, medium to high frequency noise. So uh, very recently, my colleague Steven Strother and his uh, postdoc um, published this paper. Uh, basically, they looked at data from two different studies across many different sites. Actually, these are two major Canadian brain imaging studies, Andre and Chembind. And they introduced a, a much larger set of QC parameters, as you can see. Um, the findings are that one of the most key um, parameters to consider when looking at multi-site quality control is the, the spread of the signal. So basically low spatial frequency signature in the images, which reflect um, hardware stability uh, amongst other things. So this is again, based on the F-burn phantom. And uh, so that is, I, I include the citation here if you're interested in uh, reading it. Um, so all of this is to say so far, uh, QC is predicated on, uh, even for FMI, uh, we, we don't want these low frequency fluctuations. Um, I guess this is driven by the fact that we have a phantom and also we mostly do did task FMI, but for resting state FMI, that may not work very well because we are now, um, our, our noise is now our signal. 
Right, so a typical uh, resting state after my time course you see here, um, this is sort of uh, representing two time series that are highly synchronized. You probably don't need introduction to this. Um, this is a low frequency fluctuation at around 0.1 Hertz. And but on the bottom is an example of two not so synchronized regions. So this is sort of basic analysis correlating these two is what we rely on uh, for resting state. So we cannot say uh, we want to minimize this fluctuation because that is against what we want to do. Uh, so a word on connectivity metrics, I just thought just to cover all audiences, if you didn't know, uh, we are interested in connectivity. Uh, connectivity is computed through many different ways. We have Pearson's correlation, um, independent component analysis based connectivity maps, and as well as effective connectivity. Um, but the signal itself is also of interest, right? Just looking at the fluctuation amplitude in the signal and also uh, normalized and raw fluctuation amplitude, which have been identified as potential markers of aging. So um, there's a term that I found in the literature is called imaging based phenotypes. So these can be regarded to me as resting state fMI based uh, phenotypes. So we want accurate phenotypes that reflect the biology, um, but we have to contend with all of these things. This cartoon I really like from Thomas uh, Lu's paper of in your image. So by the way, uh, Tom is giving a talk I saw on October the 12th. So I hope um, there will be good attendance. Uh, he's a great speaker always. And, and uh, this will be focused on these particular noise contributions, which I will not spend as much time on today. So, so okay, so going back to the figure, on top you have this sort of brain and you have um, motion, right? So brain, the, the head moves in multiple ways, uh, sometimes periodic with breathing and sometimes more localized motion with heart rate. And, and sometimes just sporadic motion. So you can see how these are linked to the rest of the body through this physiological system. So uh, the heartbeat introduces the well-known um, one hertz or so vascular pulsation, but it also introduces a, a low frequency pulsation. And it is connected to respiratory control uh, through sinus arrhythmia. So, so these two are really in the same circuit. And so breathing uh, has multiple effects. So it perturbs the magnetic field through changes in lung volume. It also changes the, the signal by uh, CO2 modulation. So these are actually two opposite effects, this one on the right and on the left. And so this is very complicated. And through all of this, we have to dig out what is the resting state fMRI signal, right? Um, but don't, don't uh, lose hope. I think this makes it all the more interesting. So this is my figure just summarizing what was in the cartoon. We have sort of so-called time-locked uh, respiration and heartbeat uh, noise. And we also have low frequency versions of those. And as I mentioned, uh, respiration and heart rate can both introduce different types of changes to the fMRI signal. And of course, motion is not uh, isolated, it can be respiration related and heartbeat related. So with all of this, now we have to think what, I mean, I think often what the QC standards should be. Um, so in the resting state signal, this you can, you can sort of discern where the time locked noise sources are. This one here on the right is probably for heartbeats. And then this one here at about 0.2, 0.3 hertz, that's typical for respiration. Um, but there's a lot of stuff in the low frequency band that we, we don't know how to take apart. But let's start with these two red boxes. Um, so one typical pipeline is to take um, these sort of signals, recordings, um, and then regress them out. So this is sort of generalized linear model approach is very well known. So suppose your data looks like this. You can see it's got low frequency noise, it's got drift, 
um, in this case, there's a task, but suppose this is just, you know, a, an artifact that we know about, like a heartbeat, you know, the time course of the cardiac pulsation, you can just include it as one of the regressors and, and try to regress it out so that hopefully what you have left with um, would be just neuronal specific. Um, so this is what the FSL package um, does for task-based fMRI. As you can see, this is a very typical and widely accepted pipeline. Um, so motion correction followed by distortion correction, or this is basically uh, correcting for susceptibility related distortions in the brain images. And after that, spatial smoothing, temporal filtering. Uh, the temporal filtering is meant to get rid of the drift. And then you have this uh, GLM state, uh, step. Now for resting state, there's heavy reliance on I ICA. So independent component analysis is used for denoising, then is also used for uh, extracting the brain networks. But the rest of the pipelines actually look quite similar. As you can see, the, um, there is a sort of change in ordering. So temporal filtering and spatial smooth smoothing are actually swapped for the resting state pipeline, but I don't know if most of us know, you know, which order is best. That's another question on its own. Um, so this is a pipeline I took from the Biobank paper, so the UK Biobank. Uh, so their pipeline is basically starting with simultaneous on warping or distortion correction and motion, uh, motion correction. So these are done at the same time, not so much in um, in, in series there in parallel. And then you have uh, intense denormalization, uh, which is typically um, not done for time series data, but you know, when you scan, there's an option called uh, pre-scan normalize. And so that normalizes across different um, slices. And so, so I think maybe if you do that, then there's um, maybe less need for, for this step, but they do do this step, followed by high pass filtering, which is synonymous with drift removal, and then you have ICA based denoising. So you can start to see different data sets use very different pipelines. And this one is for human brain connectome project. So this a lot of boxes, I know. Uh, I'll try to just uh, simplify by saying they use many of the same steps. You can see distortion correction here. Uh, all of this is really distortion correction, and then you have registration to the P1 space. And then at the end of all this, there's uh, ICA denoising again, so FSL ICA. Um, so can we then um, look at how they optimize these pipelines? I mean, what decision, what went into the decision to use these particular pipelines? Um, which brings me to something we have recently started to use, which is fMRI prep. Uh, so fMRI prep, I think it's uh, to me one advantage is that it, it kind of fixes a set of standard steps that we always see, but it also gives you options for running different denoising uh, techniques uh, based on your preference. So this is not a fixed pipeline. Um, they do have a fixed pipeline, but you do have the option of you know, varying it depending on what you prefer. Perhaps a really much needed study is to compare these pipelines um, to see how they each does in terms of actually removing the noise. Um, so, so, so with that, I think I wanna just talk a bit more about the low frequency noise because I think the low frequency noise is physiological noise is perhaps the least understood of all of these noise sources. Um, so, so I would say for ICA based denoising, we assume we can always detect what the noise signature is. For example, uh, you know, head motion would pro probably be, you know, um, a, a border specific or a whole brain kind of shift in brain signal. So you can tell visually that is motion. Um, but, but on the other hand, can we do the same thing? Can we look at a map and tell this is not a brain signal, this is physiological noise. This is sort of what I'm getting into right now. So uh, do these pipelines address low frequency physiological noise, which has been a topic uh, near and dear to my lab in recent years. Um, so we know uh, high frequency physiological noise, as I introduced earlier, 
uh, can affect the bullet signal through susceptibility artifacts, motion, and pulsatility and in, in blood flow. Um, but the same thing is true for, for low, low frequency physiological processes. Um, so, so when I say physiological processes, mostly I think in our field, we mean these three things. So heart rate variability or HRV, uh, respiratory volume variability or RVT, and then arterial carbon dioxide variability which is a CO2. So lots of people have looked at these factors uh, over the years. And the understanding is that they are physiological uh, in nature and they're probably not specific to brain activity. So this is how we started in this field as well. So all of these noise sources actually reside in this red box. This is a low frequency um, physiological noise band. And they are kind of entangled with the frequency in which we expect to see actual neural activity uh, induced both signal fluctuations. And uh, so this is from um, Ali's 2015 paper. Uh, lo we looked at time courses of uh, PET CO2, so entitled CO2, which reflects arterial CO2. We also looked at heart rate variability and respiratory variability. You do see there are variations, um, although this is very subject specific. So some subjects have more variability than others. So this is after you remove the cardiac frequency, after you remove the respiratory frequency, this is still there. This is the low frequency variability. So this is really where I wanted to uh, get into for, for the second half of today's talk, I wanna just focus on this. Um, so why do we wanna know about low frequency physiological noise? I think it's still the QC, right? So if we wanna get the best uh, functional connectivity maps, should we be removing these? I think that a lot of papers have started to do that, but we are, we've also been doing that. And now we're kind of turning around and trying to figure out um, what, what is this thing that we removed? Uh, really, do we fully understand it? So variance explained by these various factors, this is from Kevin Murphy's 2013 paper. Uh, so by far the biggest fraction is, is, is contributed by respiration. So RVT and CO2 are both respiratory variables and you have partial uh, CO2. In their case, the CO2 contributed um, to the least if you partial out the respiration um, variability. And then uh, these are the spatial maps of their influence. And as you can see, some of them actually coincide with known brain networks. So it is not hard to conclude that perhaps ICA cannot really pull apart these from actual brain networks if they, if they happen to co-vary. So this is sort of the first twinkle, uh, wrinkle in this problem. And this is Ali's, um, from Ali's paper showing the response functions for these various factors. Uh, so he did a uh, deconvolution to look at how, what was the frequency signature of this response. So basically we have, for example, CO2 fluctuation, which we um, then convolve with this response function to get the bold signal. Um, so this is following the excellent work from um, Katie Chang and Gary Glover and Rasmus Byrne, um, they looked at um, the, the, the response function for RVT and for heart rate variability. And so this is just to show that the CO2 variability is actually its own function. It's different. It looks different from the other two. So we also mapped out the amplitude and the timing of these response functions. And again, just to drive home the point, um, so CO2, the effect of CO2 is predominant in the posterior part of the brain, also in the, the paracentral cortices. And um, there is also a timing pattern across a group of healthy controls. So different regions consistently um, get earlier CO2 response, which could be interesting in its own. But in the context of being a noise source, you can see this can be troublesome. For example, for RVT, these regions are sort of in the same regions as 
um, the, the yellow regions are sort of the primary motor and uh, visual networks. So then if we were to look at visual motor connectivity and we removed RVT, isn't that, is that not going to influence the connectivity in those networks? So, so that is sort of why the, the mystery kind of deepened. Um, so here I, I mentioned that respiration is linked to emotion. And so Jonathan Power has shown this repeatedly. Uh, this is sort of looking at a carpet plot of a series over time. You can see some sporadic motion, but there's a lot of respiration in there. So uh, typical ways of assessing the QCing a motion correction method um, based on Jonathan's work is to look at frame-wise displacement. This is uh, a sum of absolute values of the differentiated realignment parameters uh, for all time points, basically averaging the shifts over time. There's a similar but different um, parameter called DVARs. This is just uh, sort of not based on the shift parameters. This is based on the signal intensities from uh, frame to frame. So the root mean square of these signal intensity shifts across time. Um, so of course, in our little niche field, variations are not always motion. Variation, uh, variations are not always noise. And they can also be correlated with breathing and heartbeats. So um, I keep on emphasizing this because I think this is an interesting opportunity for some very creative problem solving. Uh, so also, um, so this is from Rasmus Burns' lab, um, looking at the interactions between physiological fractions and head motion. So um, here, retro i core is um, a method introduced uh, many 1999, I think by Gary Glover's group, looking at uh, taking out the high frequency cardiac and respiratory uh, fluctuations. So. While these may not be a huge problem for task fMRI, they are definitely a huge problem for resting MRI. So, so retro I core is one of the very one of the most popular methods for that. And so, what um, Johnson et al. found is that the best performance for retro I core is achieved when the regressors uh, are are slice dependent, so they account for slice timing errors. Um, so this shows that we cannot assume motion is motion and physiological noise is physiological noise. Um, so it seems as if cor correction for the two things should be happening at the same time and not in a stepwise manner. Um, so going, to, uh, going on to look at QC for a resting state fMRI specifically, uh, so this is not a phantom study, obviously, a resting state. We can sort of embrace some of the same phantom uh, QC parameters, but when it comes to in vivo scans, um, one potential uh, sort of um, standard that's suggested in this uh, paper from UK Biobank group is to look at uh, associations with known biological relationships. For example, we know that blood pressure is high blood pressure is bad for the brain, so we expect there to be some sort of corresponding change in the connectivity. But this is also, you know, not, not always possible if we don't really want to know what the relationship is, or if we don't want to go into the circular argument of QCing based on what we already know, then, then this is not always possible. Um, so this paper is again from Rasmus Burns group. Uh, I said a lot of his papers, uh, it's really important work for our field. Um, so this is looking at the difference between eyes open, eyes closed and eyes open fixating. Um, these are three famous types of resting state. Um, now the QC parameter very explicitly is test retest reliability. So uh, basically looking at two different sessions of the same subject or looking at two halves of you know, a session from the same subject, looking to see how reproducible um, the connectivity maps are or just the, the, the signal fluctuation maps are. Um, so based on this, it's deemed that, so you see eyes open, eyes closed and fixated uh, and the higher candles W, which is another measure of reproducibility, is uh, thought to, to 
be indication of a better paradigm. So um, this is, I just thought this, this other paper by Sue and, and colleagues is, is interesting. They, they try to really target the, the physiological noise. So they, they go at it from the assumption that physiological noise is only low frequency. And they look at the ratio between the physiological noise and the background thermal noise. And um, the assumption is the lower the ratio of that, the better. Um, so again, we, we know the low frequency signal uh, is not all noise. So this is uh, sort of another interesting kind of mental exercise. But um, basically the goal of all of the denoising so far for resting state is to enhance test retest reproducibility. I think that's the most common QC parameter for resting state fMI. I'm not, maybe um, after the talk, if, if you have other thoughts, I would be happy to, I would love to hear it. So benchmarks for QC. Um, so, so far low frequency physiological processes are regarded as noise or nuisance. And the most common benchmarks include um, test retest re repeatability. Uh, typically through intra-class intra um, correlation coefficient. Um, so some of our work has also looked at spatial specificity um, as well as Rasmus's work, looking at spatial specificity of the functional networks because that's you know, conceivably another way of, of um, telling signal from noise. But I think by far test retest reproducibility is the go-to metric. It's assumed that physiological noise have no, uh, sources have no clear neural relationship and should be removed. So this is the question, should they? Then we kind of take another step back to look at whether we should be removing these parameters in the first place. So since we rely heavily on test retest re reliability, uh, we expect that if we're really removing noise, then the test retest reliability would improve. Um, but as Rasmus showed in his 2014 paper, removing physiological uh, sources actually reduced test retest reliability. Um, so the argument is that it significantly reduced intersubject variability, making different subjects seem more similar. Uh, so thus, I ICC um, being a ratio of intra to inter class. Uh, subject variability, I think this brought down the ICC um, because of the reduced inter-subject variability. So um, he looked at retro core which I mentioned earlier. He looked at RVT, uh, different ways of in in implementing it, as well as white matter CSF regression and global signal regression. And so in general, compared to no correction, Correcting for some sort of physiological uh, process reduce the, um, the, the repeatability. And so in our work, we, should, we found the same thing. Uh, basically, Ali's paper uh, in Frontiers, we, we also found the spatial specificity of the networks uh, did not improve either uh, with physiological corrections. So now we cannot, based on these conventional metrics, justify um, needing to correct for them. So maybe these metrics are not appropriate for the question, or maybe we, we also need to look at what these low frequency parameters represent. I'll just pause there for significance. Okay, so now going back to the question. So correcting for them did not seem to improve things. Um, so one half of the question is, are they actually noise? So I, I wanted to just show this paper from Yekovala and Hassan, um, basically looking at the relationships, the complicated relationships between the physiological noise, quote unquote, and the autonomic nervous system. And so uh, Katie Chang's 2013 paper also demonstrated a significant association between heart rate variability and dynamic connectivity. And further to that, uh, Yuan and colleagues from Jersey Boderka's lab showed a correlation between alpha EEG power and RVT. 
So the, the evidence is gathering that um, at least RBT and HRV may have uh, neuronal uh, associations. So uh, HRV is actually, heart rate variability is very well studied in the field of uh, emotion regulation and autonomic nervous control. And so it, it's shown to be impaired in the presence of brain damage. Um, it's correlated with EEG, multiple bands of EEG, and also covariates with things like anxiety, cognitive flexibility, um, as well as F fMRI connectivity in the prefrontal cortex. So these regions we, we know about, um, and they are parts of connect, uh, functional networks. Just to illustrate them, so these are the regions that heart rate variability has found the highest uh, level of influence, and there is some consistency in the literature. Aside from this region around the ventricles, there is also the, the frontal region and the occipital region. Um, so, so regions to look out for posterior cingulate, which is a very well-connected area, uh, medial frontal, superior parietal, occipital lobe. So these kind of encompass the famous default mode network. Um, so there's also the thalamus. And so there is definitely neural associations of the HRV. So functional connectivity positively correlated with heart rate variability are, uh, for example, the salience network, which we in our lab study, uh, different frequency bands of HRV, so high frequency lows versus low frequency HRV also have very different significance in terms of emotional regulation. So it is not definitely not disconnected with neural activity. Now RVT, so this is from Yuan's paper, which I mentioned earlier. So looking at EEG versus uh, RVT, where they demonstrated a significant association between alpha power and RVT in the eyes closed state only. And in our lab, uh, so my postdoc Sally Shams earlier this year also took this a step further to demonstrate that perhaps there are two regimes of EEG RVT association, one in which the EEG leads the respiratory variability with a positive association, and one in which the RVT leads the EEG but with a negative association. And they, if you look at these particular associations, they are. Uh, very likely to be um, connected with different types of cognition. So high, lower brain function versus higher cognition. Um, so it seems that there's something that we can extract from the timing to tell us more what, uh, how respiration is influencing uh, brain function. So regions related to RVT, this is a pictorial summary of the literature, again, I showed this earlier, basically the motor and visual networks are implicated. Um, this is pretty much reproduced across the literature. So general agreement, uh, just to reiterate, these are also overlapping with the default mode network. And so if we were to take the posterior singlet seed uh, with and without RVT correction, we sort of see a uh, very different um, connectivity patterns. Perhaps this is what can guide our QC metric. So in follow Poor's paper from 2013, you see with no correction versus with correction for RVT and um, respiratory and heart rate variability, you see this more specific sort of regions light up that are more specific to the networks um, themselves. So I, I don't know if others have seen this as well. It seems that if you do correct for these, um, you, you, you're expecting to see that the networks will come out more than the, than the, the surrounding regions. But as I showed earlier, the evidence is also kind of contradicting um, because the intra-class uh, correlation coefficient or repeatability of these maps, these maps is also lower if we correct for physiological noise. Um, so now CO2. CO2 is something we have really focused on. Um, so Ali, who's in the audience, has, ha has a whole collection of CO2-related papers. Um, basically, 
Now, our understanding of the neural associations of CO2, which was previously uh, looked into for calibrated fMRI, is now sort of the focus for resting state fMRI as well. And Driver and colleagues from Cardiff showed that uh, so even natural fluctuations in arterial CO2 can, be, um, can influence your oscillatory power in these four uh, brain bands. So there's definitely association there. We just don't know if it's enough to, to cause our functional connectivity maps to, to vary because these are resting state CO2 um, measurements. If we are assuming that CO2 is also you know, a nuisance, then we might all very, very well be wrong because CO2 is well known to be associated with arousal. Uh, it's, uh, so it's associated with cognitive abilities and it may well be that these associations extend to the resting state. Uh, so contributions by RBT and CO2 only partially overlap uh, so I showed sort of an overlap map before, but just to reiterate that CO2 fluctuation, CO2 fluctuations and influence um, do does mimic functional networks, as you can see here. So this is um, the paper we always go back to, Richard Weiss's paper from 20, 2004, looking at the associations between spontaneous CO2 and the resting state signal. So some similarities with RBT associations, right? Occipital lobe and motor cortex, but stronger. In our, in our paper, we show that these associations are stronger than are broader. And um, the brain networks associated with CO2 fluctuations. So they actually, there are networks of regions that are specific. When we try to clamp the CO2, at resting state. This we did with our Respirac system. And we, when, when we looked at the difference between networks before and after uh, CO2 clamping, this is free breathing minus clamped for the default mode network, for the motor network, and for the visual network. And you see very big differences. So all of the orange regions represent cases in which when someone is free breathing uh, at rest, their connectivity is higher. So for all of these three networks, uh, so basically over the entire networks, um, except for the visual cortex. So this is what Ali found in his paper. Um, so they're very hard to tease apart from, from actual neural activity because of the spatial overlap. And the effect of arousal uh, of resting state CO2 fluctuations we, we don't know from this experiment, so we still don't know what it is. So to, I'm, I'm coming towards the end, so to leave enough time for questions. Um, so today's talk, I want to raise the question, should, be, should we be revisiting assumptions for QC for resting state fMRI? So if HRV or heart rate variability has a functional significance, then why not RVT and CO2? I think the answer is clearly that they do. Um, so respiration and heart rate are linked through sinus arrhythmia. They're basically part of the same, same circuitry. Modulating respiration patterns can lead to heart rate variability changes. This we also showed in our work. Um, so HRV, and the respiratory fluctuations, they share variants, they share uh, space, basically they overlap spatially in terms of the regions of influence. And the above qu also questions the practice of correcting for these effects independently because they have covariations. And so they, you might be overcorrecting if you're correcting for these in a stepwise manner. Um, so is it possible to separate the neural and non-neural uh, aspects of physiological signals, because obviously I believe that each of these physiological signals has a neural influence and there's a part of it that does not, um, but that is difficult to do, obviously. Uh, so we took some inspiration from the first shallow paper um, in, in 2014, which segregated heart rate variability into two subgroups, when that leads old and when that lacks it. So this is sort of what we also found in our paper on RVT. 
And uh, physiological noise removal can reduce repeatability. This I showed. Um, so significant signal variability does not arise from noise alone. This I showed. And motion can contain neural relevant information. Um, this I did not show, but this is also known in our community. Uh, so should test, retest, repeatability remain a QC target for resting state fMRI? Um, it can be, but it cannot be the only QC target, in my opinion. Based on the, um, the accumulating evidence, we know that there are things that it does not account for. So clinical translation always often requires functional connectivity measures to be reproducible. But autonomic processes, for one, they are by nature non-stationary. So should they even be repeatable? Should we be actually looking at dynamic connectivity instead? Um, these are all just questions I don't have answers to. So how should physiological noise be handled then in resting state fMRI? I think we definitely need to, um, I, I feel, take pause and further dissect these signals as neural and non-neural. That is the most productive approach. And pre-processing pipelines that fulfill this QC requirement um, perhaps will benefit from having a biological anchor um, like the UK Biobank uh, paper suggested earlier. So this is to say we know, we have some idea which way the uh, connectivity will go with increasing or decreasing blood pressure. Uh, but at the same time, we have to uh, you know, stay aware of circular arguments which may impede discovery of new effects, right? So, um, and lastly, as I mentioned earlier, another option is to embrace dynamic connectivity. Maybe we, we look at it, embrace this dy dynamic nature. We look at how it varies instead of how different sessions should be exactly the same. <laughs> and, um, and to this, I think adding something like EEG or MEG if possible, uh, for the fMRI data could be very useful for interpretation. So I wanted to thank all the people that contributed uh, results to today's uh, work. So Ali, Saleh, uh, and um, my, my previous trainee, Jonathan, and uh, Jacob Matthews, and our collaborators, Stella and Pierre, and uh, you know, um, funding sources. And uh, this concludes my talk. Fabulous, fantastic talk, Jean. So um, <laughs> I'll uh, let the audience uh, ask the questions first. Yeah, well, I just want to mention that was a great talk. That was a great summary. Um, I was uh, trying to take screenshots so I can look up those papers. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, no, uh, yeah, uh, there are a lot of things I haven't seen, but um, yeah, but one thing, right. I mean, I think you, you hit the, I mean, as far as, uh, trying to deal with physiologic fluctuations, um, right, with resting state, like you implied at the end, um, one, it's probably premature to try to regress anything out. I'm, and it, it, even like what we, we even showed, I mean, also along with Rasmus when he was in my group as well, that, you know, when you try to use, uh, uh, you know, breathing or heart rate and try to regress these out. They, it never works that well, even uh, still. So, uh, and, it, and like you said, there's information about neural activity in that, that we still are not clear about. And that, so I think right now the answer is just to, yeah, still try to study it and to even look at things like, I mean, you know, there's drowsiness, there's, you look at things like uh, skin conductance, um, other, other, other aspects. And I like the strategy of either separating it from preceding bold versus uh, following uh, the, the relevant fluctuation. Yeah, and getting a handle on that better would be, would be really interesting. Um, but I don't think there's a, I think you sort of, my impression from your talk is that there's no answer yet. Um, we're still sort of in this exploratory stage. And, and the continuum between neuronal versus non-neuronal is sort of continuous. Um, and, and it all depends on your question. Yeah. 
So. Thank you, Peter. Yeah, so Erasmus trained with you. So a lot of these ideas you probably already know about. Um, so I, I really wanted to get your feedback, actually. Uh, yeah, I, my sense is that there's, there's no solution, but this timing, which we just came across, this timing difference, I think it might be a, a promising inroad. Uh, because if we're, for example, interested in how respiration feeds back into emotional regulation, then we cannot just regress it out. But we, we will have to look at how this respiration variability is influencing brain activity. Perhaps if it's, you know, the other way around, the, um, it, in a feedback sense, that, that is more plausible. That is the only way I can see right, right now. Um, but it is also challenging because the signals are, are uh, noisy and within the resting state fMRI signal, there's probably, you know, less than 20% of actual neuronal signal. <laughs> um, so this is very different from task-based fMRI. Um, but yeah, I, I think between the two ends of opinion, like neuronal or non-neuronal, there can be thousands of publications in the next decade because as people discover new things about these phenomena. Yeah, I was confused a little bit. One, one sort of nuts and bolts thing. Um, uh, I, and I didn't see this paper and I didn't see the study and, I, and I, it looked like Cyril actually mentioned something about this, that ICC goes down when you, when you regress these out. Um, and and right. it sort of brings to mind how you measure, how ICC is, is actually measured in this case and whether that's good or bad. <laughs> I mean, it's obviously bad right. in what ICC implies, but I, I don't know. It's hard for me to think about that, I guess. So, so Sarah, have you seen this paper? Basically, so, I mean, it's intra-subject inter variability divided by intra-subject variability. So 0.6 and up is considered to be good. Um, the higher, the better. <laughs> yeah. But it's, it's not exactly that it's proportionally. Um, but it is the fact that it is a ratio, which is the misleading part. I think we were also kind of confused by the findings. And then so I remember discussing this with Ali. How can this be? How can repeatability go down? Um, but it goes down <laughs> because different subjects are made to look more alike. Okay. Okay. Well. Um, so, I mean, we did our own study just to, to find the same thing, essentially. Either there's no effect on repeatability or there's a reduction in repeatability. So that's when we said, yes, this is a real thing. Yeah. I, I want to mention uh, Rasmus also actually made this point in the talk last week. So we have the video from the talk too. Um, it's something about, I guess, more conservative removal of the signal while trying to reduce the noise, you know? Um, right. Goes, goes back to Thomas Lew's paper, you know? Uh, and I think we made this point many times today that the boundary between signal and noise is like really thin, right? So uh, yeah, that's, yeah, another problem. Any other questions from the audience? Uh, I hope that covered everything in the chat um i guess so <laughs> yes yeah, yeah, so i'll be so, happy to share the slides of course yeah and it, this is being recorded so you don't have to worry about screenshotting anything i, I was still um, doing <laughs> <laughs> yeah i'll have this i guess yeah uh, we have, yeah, I also wanted to say it, it, it was really a, um, a great talk and a great overview, Jean. Um, covered a lot of stuff, very focused and very, and I mean, the main questions that everyone has about physiological noise, I think. And, and, and one thing that I was wondering is, you know, with all these options that we have, right, uh, of course, considering it as noise and throwing out the stuff that is modeled by HIV and RVT, it's maybe not the right way to go. But if we ask ourselves, what do we want to achieve with, with these functional networks in the first place, maybe then using the modeling of the RVT and uh, directly might also be, or the HIV might be interesting. So what is the uh, test retest reliability of these um, of these networks that we get from RVT and HIV? I think I, maybe you mentioned, but I didn't. No, I didn't. Um, well, I don't know off the top of my head. Um, 
you mean the, the reliability of the RVT associations, for example? Yeah, so if, if we say, you know, yeah. it is something about autonomous regulation and maybe in certain patients that is yeah. impaired. So maybe then we find, find actually the RVT networks in, in themselves are interesting Absolutely. biomarkers, yeah. right? Uh, yeah, but, so yeah. depends on the question. It is a very subtle point. So we cannot apply a single pipeline to all applications. We have to really think carefully about what is what it is we're trying to achieve. So uh, there is a central autonomic network that is associated with heart rate and, and respiratory variability. Um, it includes the brainstem, um, the amygdala, the insula. So these are regions that we need to look out for. But many of these regions also have other associations, right? So apart from the brainstem, perhaps. So, um, so, so judging by Rasmus's paper, it would seem that the physiological associations are very are meant to be very repeatable. <laughs> Because if you remove them, <laughs> you remove the, the within subject repeatability. Yeah, so that's yeah. right. I mean, it's, it seems like that relationship. So, so maybe that's why ICC goes down, right? The relationship between the autonomic uh, and, and these global fluctuations or whatever, localized fluctuations, yeah, mm -hmm. are very repeatable. And so you're taking yeah. away some of the Yeah. So, I, I, yeah. But it's one, the one thing that's curious, though, is still is, is um, it does look like like for instance, default mode network looks like it overlaps substantially with the with yeah. this problem with respiration. And I, we yeah. saw that as well. And, and it's sort of still kind of a mystery um, uh, why exactly that is. Um, I never, I don't think we actually ever really solved it. So. Um, I, I have a theory that it's not tested, but it's just based on observation. So um, when I was doing sort of perfusion mapping across the brain, we found regions in the default mode network to be the most perfused, most highly perfused. And so it's also no wonder because those are regions that are highly metabolic based on PET uh, data. So these are highly uh, energy consuming regions, probably highly vascularized. Yep. And they are conduits for physiological noise. It just so happens that these two mechanisms coincide. Yeah, that's actually very similar to, yeah, kind of the, what we thought could be a factor, right? Not only that they're highly perfused and highly metabolic, but also, I mean, one thing we've never really considered is sort of like, you know, making, calibrating based on the venous blood volume throughout the brain. You know, if there's higher blood volume, you, it looks like higher correlations, but it's actually just simply higher blood volume in those voxels and right, right. goes above the noise. Um, yeah, so that could be right. It could be just very vascularized areas. That I've never seen that carefully measured. So that'd be interesting. That's, uh, yeah. So it's, two um, quick comment. <clears throat> Sorry, Jim. Uh, to Lars's okay. question about, yeah, to Lars's question about maybe we should try to think about the end goal of what we're trying to do with functional connectivity and the related data. I think you were, uh, Stephen Schroeder would love to talk to you, Lars. You know, <laughs> he's been trying to develop um, resampling frameworks to allow such optimization, you know, try optimize the pre processing pipelines towards a certain target in terms of both uh, reproducibility, spatial depending on how you define it, as well as uh, other targets. You know, I put a link to the in the chat so you can take a look at many of his papers. Um, so it is possible, I think. Uh, and it's probably a good point to think about too. Uh, sometimes maybe we don't need to remove all the noise as long as it meets certain other criteria for certain goals in certain applications. We don't know all that, but I just want to mention. The second point I wanted to add, make maybe suggest is, I think this sounds like a very nice uh, focus for a short perspective paper to get people to think about it or educate them on this, you know? Uh, this video is a one way to get there, but I think academics are used to receiving their information via theory with papers and nowhere else, you know? <laughs> so maybe like a couple of uh, pages, write this down, nice link, organized list of references would be a good idea, you know? Let me know if you guys are interested. Yeah. Yeah. To, to your first point, uh, Pradeep, I think, I think what I found really intriguing in, in, in Gene's talk was this idea of the um, 
modeling this feedback loop, right? Basically going one step further because I think test retest reliability has exactly this problem of assuming stationarity that, that clearly is violated in these autonomous processes. So, so if we had a way of, you know, proper, mm -hmm. you know, proper modeling, what you would expect would, would a feedback loop look, look like? And then, you know, using both, integrating both the physiological data and the brain data and such a model, that might be a, a way forward to disentangle. I think for physiological noise, there was once this stochastic state space model called, I think, oh, I forgot the name, I think Drifter or something. Um, so they really used like a Bayesian modeling approach to integrate the, how the brain would basically uh, look like as a consequence of the... Um, yeah, I mean, this goes stock. back to the, uh, this goes back to the dynamic phantom stock uh, discussion we had over the group and then previous talks, you know? So I think they try to kind of provide some ground truth. I mean, that's more a hardware issue, but I think also relevant here. And the discussion about how do you define a SNR? You know, I, I'm trying to get people to get, give some dates to organize the discussion, but this I think this keeps coming back. You know, we need uh, good ways to define a SNR under different circumstances. What is signal? What is noise? You know, so uh, I hope you encourage more people to join the group and share their perspectives or write a paper together. Yeah, you know? great. Anyway, I have to get going for another meeting I'm missing right now, but this was great. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Peter. Yeah. Thank Thanks. you so much for coming. Yeah, great. Yeah. We have uh, two new uh, participants here. I just want to say hi to Mary and Alistair here. You, know, you guys want to share your thoughts? Hello. Uh, I really enjoyed your talk. Thanks so much. Um, Thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think um, we've had problem. I've been involved in a couple of projects trying to optimize, you know, develop new methods for addressing outliers and, and various sources of noise. And we keep coming up, running into these issues of figuring out what metric is the best to evaluate them, right? Like, and it, it doesn't, in a, lot of, in a lot of cases, it doesn't seem like ICC, um, you know, is, is maybe telling us what, what we think it is, so. Thanks. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Absolutely. Um, I wish I, I, I could provide a, a sort of recommendation. I always <laughs> like to do that at the end of our papers. So we recommend this. Right. But at this time, we just said we recommend not to do this. <laughs> so, yeah. Or at least, right, I think also, you know, some of the things that people mentioned, like, um, I feel like uh, there's this tendency to, it. I, I'm more, more familiar with trying to deal with motion artifacts, right? And I feel like there's this tendency to just like cut it out. And yeah. if there's anything left, you know, like you don't want anything left. Um, and an alternative strategy I think is to like give justification why you weren't necessarily a stringent um, and, a, and like acknowledge the limitations of what you did, right? Because all of like there, everything's a trade off and, um, you know, we should just acknowledge that more openly. Right. Actually, uh, Stephen was the one that called my attention to papers that demonstrate motion is actually uh, can be a, a marker of cognition. It can be a marker of personality. It's not just a nuisance. So for studies that particularly want to look at those, <laughs> maybe you're throwing out the baby with the bathwater. Actually, like, love the way Mary described it. You know, maybe we should acknowledge, you know, what assumptions we are making when we conclude that, right? Yeah. So I think that's another perspective that is actually probably lacking in the community that we should probably say. But it's, it's some, it's in some ways it's related to the COVID as guidelines. You know, how they report papers and methodology look at details. So we'll have to. We can probably try give us some sort of a map to what to acknowledge when, you know, or what to report when, mm -hmm. uh, that would be awesome too. So, and maybe I can, are you guys interested in writing such a paper or is that too much work? <laughs> 
I would need one of the experts to lead the paper. I can't lead it. I am not an expert in this domain at all. You know, if it's Ali or Jean or Lars, um, I know you are all like committed 275% already. But <laughs> <laughs> that would never it's an go important down. paper. No, it's, it's only going to go up. It's, yeah, it's basically turning this talk and, and the other relevant work into an organized set of thoughts to say, hey, yeah. be aware of this, make sure you report this, don't or broadly generalize your findings when you all, when you all, all you did was this very specific thing, you know? Yeah. yeah. Well, actually that was the intention with our symposium at OHPM last year was to call attention to this issue. So it often follows a paper is written uh, on a similar topic. Um, mm -hmm. But there are experts on, in the field in that symposium. So maybe we should keep the conversation going because this could be very impactful. So if I wasn't yeah. committed 270%, um, I okay. mean, I am still interested, but um, I would definitely like to contribute in some way. Yeah, I mean, this the whole goal of this group is to actually try get those perspective and recommendations, you know, both what to do and what not to do, you know. So, uh, you know, yeah, may, maybe I can put Lars or Mary on the spot to try take the lead. <laughs> I'm I'm really struggling to finish a paper right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No worries. Yeah. You don't have to say yes, but this, this has been great. Um, so maybe uh, we, any other questions or comments before we call it a day? Just to clarify, because because Jean, you said you know you would rather recommend not doing things. So is is that really your conclusion? Saying we should do <laughs> any of what you just presented, any of this modeling, or? Um, there's always a silver lining. I kind of call attention to our approach in like the neuroimage image paper from this year, sort of looking at the timing and then looking more at the literature in terms of the feedback, because there's, there's a whole literature out there independent of fMRI. I started to dig into it. Um, so yeah, if I have enough time to come to some sort of recommendation, that would be the best way because I don't want people to give up hope and this is not worth my time. I, I should just get into something else like, CT, <laughs> um, but ideally, yeah. So, so I think the majority of things we we can say confidently are still just things that are that you should not do. Unfortunately, that's where we are right now. But maybe in a couple of years, it would be more upbeat. Fabulous. Um, thank you so much, Jean. Um, thank you for inviting Ali, me. Ali, you want to say something? Uh, yeah. Hey, Ali, uh, do you have any comments? Uh, hey, uh, no, hey. not really. Well, uh, <laughs> what else can I add? I think Gene's talk was very comprehensive. Uh, yeah, but uh, yeah, I think that the new uh, type of study, the processing that she's doing that, uh, checking the lag between the uh, physiological signals and fMRI signal. I think that was really interesting to me. And yeah, and I, so I, I just want to reiterate that uh, the ICC, the reproducibility measure is not really very interesting. And there are, you know, in our papers, I think, and in other papers, I've seen several new metrics to evaluate. I think each of them has their own assumption, just like uh, ICC. But um, yeah, none of them are perfect. But again, there are different methods. And then I think the best way is to just use a group of uh, metrics to compare different methods. Yeah. I yeah. think if we had um, you know, a better knowledge of the physiological networks, that may be a way. I mean, if we can sort of se separate the, 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 the physiological versus non-physiological networks, um, not to say the physiological networks are, are, are useless, but it's just to distinguish that from like another network, like the salience network. 
Yeah, I think this goes back to what Lars was suggesting, you know, having a model that explains the whole uh, feedback loop, so to say, you know. Um, I wonder if, uh, I don't know if, uh, um, if the new virtual brain project are similar simulation platforms, for example, from the human brain project, et cetera, can help achieve such a model that take all these confounding factors into account and build some a nice, uh, process that we can really test on regular, uh, realistic human Im neuroimaging data. You know, that's another, that'll be an interesting project. I, I'm assuming, uh, yeah, maybe not. The virtual brain project or the human brain project must have come, up, come across this need to account for respiratory and other uh, physiological issues. Um, so I actually wanted to just, uh reiterate something else that Peter brought up. Uh, I, mm -hmm. I kind of forgot to mention that earlier. I think that is another silver lining, in fact, for, for us, because we, if we do multimodal fMRI, like, and so CBF in itself is sort of a mix of neuroactivity and blood flow. So maybe not such a pure vascular measure, but CBV, if we can establish a connection between physiological um, effects and the vasculature, things like vascular density, uh, vascular volume, then we can, we, I think we, we are not too far from being able to use uh, things like CBV for, for um, controlling for the vascular effect. So, so the vascular effect is sort of the intermediate. And so it leads the physiological noise to affect specifically uh, certain regions in the brain. So that might just be due to vascular density, not, not due to actual neural involvement, right? So that might be a closer target, in fact, because we have that. So Renzo Huber's uh, work and also many others really put CBV mapping in the spotlight. Cool, thank you. Um, so right, I have, have to go. Yeah, um, so. thank you everyone. Mary, go ahead. I was just gonna say thanks. <laughs> yeah, we're fabulous. Um, join us for other talks coming up. You know, I 